Hello, everybody, and welcome to Rocket Lasso Live. I am Chris Schmidt, and thank you, everybody, for coming and hanging out today. It is very exciting because we are finally launching the Utility Spline Collection. I've been showing this thing off for, I think, over a year. We ended up rearranging the order that we released a couple tools where we put Slicer and Ricochet a little bit further ahead, and I think even Mesh the Spline, where these were pretty close to ready almost a year ago. There's been a lot of other things to do and deal with in the meantime. But I'm very excited to talk about a bunch of the stuff that we are working on. But mostly we're going to be talking about all the new utility spline functionality. How is everybody doing in the chat? I haven't seen a lot of people in a bunch of months. So we got YouTube going. Seems to be working well. We've got Twitch going. Also seems to be working, which is shocking. I had to remember a bunch of things because it has been a few months. The last stream was, I think, in September. Maybe late August. But in any case, we're back, and not only that, I'm going to announce today that I think next week will be the first official. The uh, next week will be the first official episode of Rocket Lasso Live Season Five. Season Five already, super crazy. Um, so I'm trying to think of other things to mention. There's a bunch. I mean, Rocket Lasso has been working on a bunch of different things. There's a bunch of cool things that are going to be happening this year. We're already starting the process of planning half res. So if you want to pencil in the date, it's probably going to be September 8th. That seems to be what we're locking in. And it's going to be the 10 year anniversary of half res. So it's going to be a big one and we've got bigger plans than usual. So definitely mark that one down in the calendar, save the date. And I believe that there is a save the date for Camp MoGraph, which is a week after that, which is also very cool. I'll probably be there as well. Um, what are some other things to mention? Well, Rocket Lasso has been working directly with Maxon and Maxon has been doing, uh, for the most part, monthly updates where they're outputting a bunch of things in the asset browser where they're releasing new materials and textures. And every month Rocket Lasso has been creating a new capsule tool. And I'll be talking about two of them today a little bit in the stream because they work well with the utilities plans as well. But we're working on, there's a bunch of cool ones coming out that I can't really talk about yet. And a couple we've already released. I'm going to be recording some tutorials about how to use those soon. But yeah, a bunch of, uh, that's a bunch of news across the board, hopefully. Catching everybody up a bit. Um, so... As I mentioned, we're going to be focused on utility splines today. Next week will be regular questions. It's super exciting to finally talk about the utility splines because especially as we are getting near the end of last season, we were working hard on getting the utility splines wrapped up and a whole bunch of questions people had, I ended up having to use utility splines in order to create the best output. But it was like, but people didn't have the tools yet and now it's finally out there. So let me open up a different window. Let me check the chat. How's everybody doing? What is new? Why don't we jump in the cinema and start talking a little bit about the new tools? Because these are a little different than some of the other things that we have released. I mean, I know that uh, compared to, you know, plugins I used to work on back at GSG. I'm going to switch the camera now. Compared to plugins I used to work on back at GSG, ours are a little bit more technical and they're not quite as flashy. But in particular, the utility splines are not flashy. These are utility splines. They're meant to be behind the scenes doing hard work that would be a pain in the butt to do otherwise. So, you know, I didn't think it was justified in making a big, like, animation for this tool. It's more like, hey, when somebody needs it, the client has a particular problem, that's when you're going to reach out and need to use these splines. Although I think we're going to be using them, like, every day in live streams. So, moving on into Cinema 40, I'm in 2023... 0.1.3, there was a recent update, probably just some bug fixing. The last video I released was the 0.1 update, which was a huge update with all the new pyro stuff, which was really cool. But I have already got the new utility spines installed, as I should have mentioned already, but if you haven't already picked them up, then there is a $10 sale going on right now. The If you're supporting on Patreon, then there's actually extra sales. You should be able to go down, and there's links in the description below on Twitch or in YouTube. So there's links for everything. If you're supporting on Patreon, I guess I should pop back up again. If you're supporting on Patreon, then if you support at $10, you get an $11 discount. If you support at $20, you get a $21 discount. And if you're supporting at $50, you get a $51 discount. So instantly pays for itself. Uh, and that also applies to all the different plugins across the board. So it's actually like huge savings. But there's a $10 sale right now for everybody across the board. So it's a good time to come and pick it up. Back to Cinema 40. Now, my plan is I have a bunch of different files that I didn't end up using in any of the videos. And I thought it'd be kind of cool to go through those. They're going to be a little less... 
uh, polished, but I thought it was more fun than just repeating the exact same ones from the original demo. So let me just move to the correct folder there. Now, something worth mentioning is I did include like 14 different files. I guess we can go through some of those. Let me open up. Do, do, do. So here is when you download your copy of Utility Spline. This is what you get. So there's a version for PC. There's a version for Mac. Something I forgot to mention is when you are installing it, because there's five plugins, let me show you. Inside of Cinema, there are five plugins. So it's actually in this flyout window. So because I installed the PC version, you can see that the folder has the name displaying here in the extensions. So it will say PC. And I guess the one that would be visually annoying is you got like this Mac 21 plus. So when you go and copy this into whatever file that you have, feel free to rename the folder. So if you just rename the folder to like utility spines, then that's what it will rename itself to be uh, everywhere else. So, you know, just keep in mind that you're free to modify that. It doesn't break anything. I got to remember to leave that linked right now the way it is because it will break my current one because I am always linked to the last launch version. But in any case, there is a link to the help. There's install videos. But most importantly for our purposes is there's an entire folder with 14 different example files that we can step through some of them in the most basic form. So let's just open up a little bit of those. Um, okay, so let's open up the first file. This is the first file that's included. It's actually the one I use in a bunch of the demo video. So it's like really straightforward. But I do think it shows off a couple of tools really well, especially something like this. So the idea here is this is like a jittery camera path that you've gotten imported from like tracking a phone or an object in space. Maybe you pull in the spline from After Effects. So you end up with this type of shape. And it might be what you want. You want all the jitter and all the extra detail. But you can go into your extensions, grab any of the five plugins. And in this case, I want a smooth. So creating this smooth spline, I can now drop my camera track inside of Rocket Smooth and pull back on this. And you can see that I can add many iterations of smoothing and smooth parametrically the spline completely out. Utility Splines is returning a, a spline into Cinema. So something like a align the spline tag is going to work perfectly on here. We can feed this through a sweep and a inside. And you can see that the smoothed out version is what is going to be seen passing through the object. So you can just filter everything through that way. So having said that, let's add a couple iterations of smoothing and you see we get a nice smooth camera track. We can copy the original so you can see how I have modified one spline into the other. Now let's start pushing a little bit more. If I go further, you see it gets really, really smooth, but just by the very nature of it, what we're doing on a very technical level, let's take a look at these points. We get all these points. And so say this point, to smooth it, we are looking at the neighbor and the other neighbor, and we're averaging out the distance a little bit between those to modify where this goes. But that means as you iterate again and again and again and again, that it's going to shrink. Everything will naturally kind of pull towards each other. So in order to avoid that, I've got a setting called counter scale. So I can push this back out again, and if I unhide this one, you can now see that by counter scaling, we can get this to match the original shape way more because we are pushing those back out again. Something in the training I don't go into too much, but there's actually a lot of control for it is under advanced. You can control the number of smoothing iterations for calculating the distance to push it back and the number of tangent iterations. So these are additional settings for like, how does this round out and clean up how it should return to its original shape? So you can see how we could just clean up a little bit, but do more iterations and smooth them all out even more. So anyway, it's a nice clean way of cleaning up that camera track. But uh, let's talk about some fancier things. In fact, let's just do very simple scene files to begin with. So start out with a text spline. By the way, anybody who has any questions, feel free to throw them into the chat and I will be keeping an eye out for them. Um, if you just like at Rocket Lasso or something, so it pops out at me, but I'll be playing around. So feel free to ask any, any questions that you want. Okay, so simple text object. Let's put that in the middle, maybe scale it up a bit. Let's call it utility. Cool, hit S for focus on all selected and feed this into a smooth. So holding down Alt will automatically make it a child of the smooth. And let's pull back on the iterations. And let's take a look at maybe on a technical level what's going on a little bit. We've got the spline, and as I add iterations, you're gonna see it's gonna start smoothing and shrinking. But why, say, look at this letter T. Look at the letter T, it's gonna shrink really, really small, really quickly. The only one that's kind of showing up still is the, is the U. Well, in a lot of ways, that's not surprising because this is taking all of the existing points. 
Now, a letter U has a big curve on it, which means that there are a whole bunch of different points on it. Now, we've got a setting here called tick marks, and you can turn on result, and you'll see these little, and we can make them larger here. I can say three for the live stream. You can see we get these little tick marks showing where the existing points are. So when I'm smoothing, there's a lot of points here to work with. Therefore, this curve gets nice and smooth. But these other ones, they don't have many points, so they're gonna shrink down really quickly. Now, that's not what I want to have happen. So how can I get around that? Well, we can do that via our point input. I can say, actually, let's do this a little bit more step by step. I'll pull this out and let's feed this into a different spline utility. So I'm gonna feed this into a resample. So now I'm in a completely different spline and it's currently set to step mode. I would like to see what we're changing. So let me change it to show the result. And you can see I've got now, make them larger again. I've got tick marks showing and I have now re parametrically resampled the distribution of all these points along the text. It's gotten resampled, which means there's more points for us to play with. If I now feed this resample into the smooth, the smooth will now be able to, let me hide the tick marks. We are now viewing the extra subdivisions, meaning as I add extra iterations, you can see how everything's getting rounded out now instead of being shrunk down to oblivion because there's a more even point count. Something that is pretty handy here is the tick marks are really important for being able to see. So what we did is, it was so important is if you double click on the icon, it will actually automatically activate the tick marks. And if you double click again, it will turn them off. So I always love sneaking bonus functionality by double clicking an icon whenever we can. And showing the tick marks I thought was the most important thing here for actually being able to interact with your spline. So um, yeah, so that is a nice simple re-smooth or smoothing out of this overall. We can again counter scale, try and maintain the entire shape a little bit more depending on how we've modified it. But let's go further and start playing with some fancier demos. Um, what is, yeah, let's do, let's do the ricochet demo really quick because I think this one's pretty cool. So let's begin with a chunk of text. We'll keep it relatively clean so we can do this on a live stream. I'll say RKT. I want a nice chunky font. So the official font of Rocket Lasso plugins is lemon milk, bold usually. So there we've got some text. Let's make it a little bit thicker. And my favorite workflow, which I was doing a bunch last stream or last uh, season, is throwing some geometry into a builder, throwing that into a mesher, adding enough subdivisions in to make it look nice and clean. And in this case, I'm going to keep it simple by blobbing them into each other a bit. So I'll add a dilate to make them inflate a bit, grab the text and put a little negative spacing in there. And there, now you see the text is slightly intersecting each other. And you see our relatively large polygon count here. So then I take that and feed it into a wonderful remesh. I'll say I only want 10% of the final polygons and I'd like to have very little adaptiveness so that all the polygons will be relatively similar. Actually, we don't have to go that low. Let's say uh, 25. So yeah, all the polygons are relatively the same size. So that gives us really clean, even geometry to work from, which generally speaking is a good idea. So what I would like to do is use a completely unrelated plugin. We're gonna use Ricochet, so another Rocket Lasso plugin. But we'll create that one. And if you haven't seen Ricochet, it's really, really fun. I'm gonna drag this down, put it inside of the text, and I'm gonna say, okay, Ricochet, I'll pull this down below. Say, okay, Ricochet, you are going to view what object? Well, I want to view that remesh. So I drop that in, and now I'm going to visibly hide the remesh. And now I've got a essentially a laser that's bouncing off the insides of that geometry. So as I increase the length, you see I'm going to have this laser bouncing and bouncing and bouncing. So let's add on an extra zero. And now I've got these lines bouncing around all over the place. Now we can keep on changing. Maybe we'll go to... Um, I'd like to change the seed, so I'll just keep on clicking randomize on the seed until I get a relatively even distribution. Like that looks pretty good. So what I'd like to do now is use some of the awesome new simulation stuff inside of cinema. So the basic idea would be something like adding a simulation rope. Now we can just do that out of the gate and I can hit play and that should work if I hit play. Those are, but they're gonna follow the scene. So let's turn off gravity. So control or command D, simulation. And under the scene, I'll say, hey, no gravity, please. And now I can hit play. And now we see we got some text and it's just sort of drifting along. But the problem right now is, I mean, 
ricochet is being as optimized as it can be, there's only a point every time it bounces off a wall, but I want a really clean, visible distribution of those points. So let's delete that tag, the simulation tag for now, and feed it into a smooth. So there it is with the smooth, but remember there's very few points, so the smooth is gonna be really extreme. So something that we did is, it's so common when you're smoothing things out that you're gonna to want to resample that we built some of the simple resampling modes directly into smooth. So selecting our point input, currently we're seeing the baked line. It bakes down whatever the line input was and seeing those raw points. In fact, let's uh, double click on the icon. We can see the exact points we have, which are essentially only on the outside where the collisions are happening. So I can say, instead, I would like to do a step. So this is going to walk along the spline and now every five units, it's making another point. So now we've got a very clean redistributed point count that's very even and ready for us to run a rope simulation on there like way better. So here's the thought. Let's again add the simulation rope. And I would like to make that original mesh that we have right here. I want to make that a collision. I want to be able to collide with that. So I'll say simulation. Where is it? Um, yeah, just a collider. And I'm going to say it collides with the back of it with zero friction and zero bounce. So hopefully that works. In our rope, before we do anything else, I'm gonna say, hey, it's very, very bendy. I'm gonna put 555, five, five, which is a good number for just like, it's super duper bendy. If it wants to bend, it can. I'll get rid of zero, I'll do zero friction so it can freely slide past itself. And we've got a radius. I'll set that to a radius of one. So not changing anything else, let's hit play. And there you go. Now you can see that we've got a nice even point distribution everywhere. And it is now trapped inside of that text. So if I hit play, you can see it's drifting around, unhide the original object, and you see it's currently trapped inside. So now we just need to figure out the balance here. What's a maybe good radius? I'll say a radius of two. Yeah, look at that. A radius of two is now very much filling up that entire space. That might be a little extreme. Let's try 1.5. I'm totally guessing numbers here. Uh, 1.5 is probably good for our purposes where you can see how it's drifting around a little bit. Now, if we add just a little bit of friction here, it'll probably go a long way. Let's see, a little friction. Yeah, you can already see a little friction goes a long way to stopping it from moving too much. It can't slide so freely past themselves. So anyway, you can see here, I was able to very easily resample this spline and feed it through. But where I want to push it now is we always want to run simulations on the lowest poly object as possible, or in the case of a spline, the lowest point object that we possibly can. So this was a nice point count. If we go back here, it's going to show the unmodified version. But you can see, you know, our point count isn't crazy. Very reasonable. You can see it's running very well on my machine here in real time. So... I, I could say, hey, like put five times as many points so that there's more resolution, but that would slow down our simulation, have more calculation time, more caching time, you know, and in the end, more render time. So instead, if I want to make this look smoother, and let me actually feed this into a sweep and feed into the sweep and end side. And we know we made a radius of 1.5 and I'll say 12 sides. So there we go. Very nice looking kind of tube going through. You can see that we're getting no collisions through anything. And a nice even polygon count, but we do end up with, you know, a lot of faceting here. You can see how that corner is very sharp. A lot of these angles, you can definitely tell that there's some pretty sharp angles here. Now, here is the best part when it comes to the way Maxon built their new simulation stuff. And that is the rope tag, the rope simulation, is treated as a modifier. So... It is live. We're seeing a deformed version of the original stuff, meaning I can take right now live this spline, which has been rope simulated, and feed it into another smooth. So now, now it's going overboard right now, but we'll, I'll show you the fancy stuff in a second. But you can see I can just feed in a ricochet, smooth it out, resample it, run a rope simulation, and then take the result of that and smooth it again. So if I hit play right now, in real time, we are now smoothing out the result that got fed through the entire system. Simulation is running prior to this. So now, here's the idea, or here's what I'd like to do. Let's double click on this smooth, and then we can see the tick marks from this. I want to smooth this out, but if I add on any smoothing here, even just one or two ticks, you can see, yes, that has become smoother. But as I did that, then the lines are going to start intersecting with each other. We're moving pieces around, which means, you know, there's going to be some pretty blatant intersections. So we've got some other point input modes that are going to come in really handy. Let's take a look over here, even hit NB so we can see all of our polygons. I'm going to say, I would like to take this line and subdivide it some more. I will say, hey, 
take whatever your current points are and subdivide. And you see now that every point has a point in between. I can say, actually, subdivide again. So now every one of those points has an extra point in between. So we've now got times two times two, the number of points. But with all that extra additional geometry, that means I can start adding, you know, essentially you can see here that we still have this, look, look like right here, we still have this very hard edge, but we have all this extra new geometry, which the smooth can act upon. So as I start adding in iterations of smoothing, the overall spline isn't moving too far, but now we get a nice smooth curve out of that. So you see if I push back on the iterations, it is, it, it is very hard edged and ran a nice, queen a nice clean simulation. But if I add on some smoothing, your subdivide smooth. Now, yes, we have modified it, but because we put extra geometry, there's gonna be very, very little in the, in the way of visual intersection. So now look at this resulting spline. So essentially we're getting no intersections because we ran all of our nice soft body, but we get all of the fidelity of a subdivided spline. So I, I love that workflow. So you see how great that's looking overall. And that's all running live. So I can hit play again. And you can see how we run the simulation on the low point version. And then we subdivide and smooth out. And it's all just working fine. So awesome. Super love the way that that works. Now, let's talk about another utility that we haven't talked about yet at all. And that is, as smoothing is the one I'm going to be using most often. Smoothing is amazing. Like you reach for it constantly to just clean up splines, resample, smooth them out a little bit. It's great. But probably the next most important in my mind is the reduction spline. So let's take a look at what we're seeing here. You see that we've got lots and lots of points generating this sweep. What I'd love to do is feed the resulting, you know, we've got ricochet into a smooth, into a smooth. Let's feed that smooth into a utility. Actually, I'm going to put the wrong one first so I can show you something else. I'm going to put this into a cleanup. So we're feeding that into a cleanup spline. But the reason I put a cleanup spline is to show you that you can always switch between the tools. We made the ability for you to select any one of the utility splines and say, actually, I'd like you to be a reduction instead. So now we are in reduction mode. With reduction what the reduction utility spline does is it starts removing points. We've got four completely different algorithms for it. And we don't have to go into all of them in tons of detail, but we have the ability to reduce the overall angle. So anything below a certain threshold angle, it will remove. So we say if it's shallower than one, let's do 10. If it's shallower than 10, it's going to start removing points. And we've got optimize, which is going to step every certain distance. Like here I'm saying, Keep on erasing any points that fall on the spline until you're at least five units away and keep on removing. So you see, I've kind of uniformly reduced across the board and that one's actually pretty useful. We can remove a certain percentage where we are now removing, I, I'm removing 25% of the points and it's gonna keep on removing the most shallow of points. So we've now removed 25% of the least important points. But by far to me, the mode I use 90% of the time is deviation mode. Now, what deviation mode is doing is it is a, it's a really cool algorithm that we put together that it is essentially rebuilding the spline step by step. And it's saying, did this line drift? If I keep on removing points, is that line at any point drifting more than one centimeter away from where it originally was? And so what I can do here is say, okay, yes, this is drifting more. This, this is allowing it to drift one centimeter away, but let's get more definition. Now. I'm going to say 0 0.2, 0 0.2 centimeters. So as I say 0 0.2, you see that more detail came back. I can say 0 0.1. So now it has to be within 0 0.1 units of where it used to be. Otherwise it can't remove it. Now the idea here is that it is perfectly removing the least important of the edges. Essentially, if something is very straight, it can be removed and you're not going to be able to visually tell so something with a sharp curve gets maintained, but something with a bunch of curve to it doesn't. And you see here that a lot of that got removed because it's a very shallow curve. Meanwhile, up here, something with a sharp curve that's maintaining more of them. Now, if you move it to the advanced tab of any of these tools, you're going to see some point feedback. And this came in with 80,000 points, 80,001 points. And we have dropped it by saying, this deviation mode, I've dropped it down to 46,000 points, meaning I have removed more than 40% of the points here. Like those just weren't needed visually and they have been removed. So in this particular circumstance, like maybe that's not super important, like the render time is not going to be super different between the two, but 
be able, being able to clean up and reduce the points of a spline is super huge. So yeah, very excited for that combination of the tools. So yeah, that's a that's sort of a demo stepping through a bunch of what we can do with some of those tools. What is the next thing we should talk about? A little bit more advanced, but let's to what degree should we build it from scratch? I don't want to spend too much time building things from scratch here, but this is another demo file that is that comes included. And we made this file in Mesh to Spine. In the Mesh to Spine live stream, we covered how to make this with a different tool from Rocket Lasso. But this is a nice final mesh of this car. What we have done is, let me turn these all off. We've got all these parts of a car that's inside the asset browser. So you see we get this lovely car here. It's pretty clean and low poly. And then using Mesh to Spline, we did things like, hey, I'm going to take the body of the car. So you see that is all of these components. And I feed them into, I'm going to visually hide that, and feed that through the uh, outline mode inside of Mesh to Spline. And you see I generate a spline that's outlining all of those polygons. And then we've got a different one that is going to create any edges that are a, a pretty sharp angle. So we get these nice highlights from that. And then we can say, oh, here's some more splines that are going to be every single polygon from the body. And we keep on layering up where here is the glass. And I'm going to hide all the geometry now. So I'm now taking all the glass and outlining it in white. And then here are the interior parts of the car in a nice light tan and more interior detail. And then we've got the rubber of the tires and here's the rims. So I've now parametrically converted all those to a spline without ever needing to make anything editable and you know, tons of controls there. I'm not gonna do a big mesh to spline demo here, but we can now feed this through our new systems in utility splines and get extra functionality. You saw we are pulling all that in from a very low poly object. So we end up with a very low point count on the car. Now this looks great from a little bit of a distance, but if we zoom in, you're gonna see that like we start losing a lot of detail. I feel like we can see it most right here. We get these very sharp angles. So here's what's pretty cool. Another thing that's cool about some of the utility spines, we put a lot of work into these. If I create this smooth, we do not have to feed well, let's feed one object in. Let's just grab this red, these very bright red highlights. Actually, let's turn everything else off for a moment. So we got this highlight right here, and I can drop, you can see that it's red. I have actually told this object to automatically be red. But if, if I feed that into smooth, you can see that it's still red. Smooth is like, oh, that's a red object. I will maintain it as red. Now that's being fed through smooth and it is you know, ready to go where you can smooth it out. But let's push this further by grabbing all those other splines, all the parts of this car, grab all of them and drop them all as a child. Now, what it's currently doing, well, you'll see the icon change. If I click on it, it says trigger a refresh. What, we want to switch the mode because right now it's like, oh, there's more than one spline. So if I click override or if I double click on the icon, it's going to override. And now it's acknowledging this is a, a different type of spline. But what's cool is smooth is now being fed multiple splines. We've got all those different splines going in and smooth is like, okay, each of them is being returned separately as their own color. So if I were to, let's, it's gonna kind of obliterate it, but let's just do a bunch of smoothing on there, which you know can look kind of cool there, like jumping, and you see how quick this is running. You see we're smoothing those all out. But if I click off of it, all the colors are maintained. If I make the smooth editable, it's going to be a null, and inside of it is each of those individual objects, each with their own appropriate color assigned to them. So let's make this a little bit more actually practical. So grabbing the smooth, let's get rid of all of those iterations of smoothing and do a very similar thing to what we just did with that rope simulation. If I had smoothing on right now, there's not very many points. So as I add on iterations of smoothing, it's going to heavily modify it. But instead, I go, I'll go, i double click and now we can see where every single one of those points are. And I can say subdivide that one time. And now there's a point in between each point. I'm going to say, hey, subdivide it twice. So there's way more points now. But now, and, and we are exceeding the point count. So here's another cool detail. I'm glad that happened. You'll see the icon grays out and we get this little X on there. And there's also this override. What we did is you can imagine that I could accidentally click 20 in here and suddenly you're trying to make like a 2 billion point object. That would be bad. That would freeze up cinema effectively. So under advanced, we have a point cap and it's just our tool is going to say like, oh, we hit the point cap. So don't go any further, but we can obviously increase that amount. But even better is if you're confident that what you fed in is okay, 
you can just click this override button or you can double click again on the icon that's contextual double click on the icon and it says okay cool the user thought that was safe i will override the value and now you'll see that our point cap has jumped up to exactly what the incoming point count was is what it's set to so now i'm subdividing twice and i, want, I don't want to lose the colors so i'm going to lock that and deselect so we can actually see the colors so now that we've subdivided, I am now free to begin adding on some iterations of smoothing without obliterating the overall shape of the car. So with two smoothing iterations and two subdivisions, you see I've now added this curve in on the object. We've gotten this curve there. We've gotten everything rounded out very nicely without destroying the overall shape. So again, let me show you if we go baked line and do two, two iterations, like look how rounded everything's become. But if we subdivide a little bit, shape is maintained so we could even subdivide more and we could smooth more we got lots of different options we can counter scale a little bit to try and maintain that original shape if that was like being smoothed or not you see that that is maintaining shape way more so that becomes nice and rounded if you're going to sweep this or if you're going to render this out say with redshift and just render the final lines or render this as hair all of that is going to be maintained for us and we didn't have to worry about any of it i'm going to double click again hide those lines i don't need to see them zoom out and the entire car has gotten smoothed out and created you know it's created a bunch more subdivisions but it's gotten really smooth but again if you want everything to run more quickly say at render time i could take this smooth and feed this into the deviation well the uh, reduction again holding down alt it'll automatically feed in double click to override the point count and we've got the deviation which is you know pretty high right now i'm gonna say 0 0.1 so as i click on 0 0.1 you can see that my curve seems to be very well maintained but if i click on the reduction and go to advanced mode you can see that this went from eleven thousand points almost twelve thousand points oh i'm sorry this went from a hundred and fifteen thousand points and we dropped it to forty thousand points there are we got rid of 65 percent of all the points needed but visually speaking I think it's gonna be like almost impossible to see the difference i'm gonna turn on and off the reduction so here's reduction off and here's reduction on look like are you are you even seeing like at the most i'm seeing like a pixel's worth of difference between those two things but i've gotten rid of 65 percent of the points and all of those essentially would be redundant and being you know taking longer to run or making your simulation take longer to run so being able to remove that's why i love deviation the ability to remove points with a single setting just a single tolerance setting and you're pretty much saying like hey if you're if you're barely turning you could probably remove some points so lots of redundancy there and I was able to get rid of all of them so super cool i love that tool so let's move on into another demo actually let's uh check out the chat see if anybody has any questions and then we'll start moving into maybe some demos that i didn't have in any of the other videos um mr matt dog can you convert these splines to a lower point bezier spline with handle curves that could be used to export to illustrator um that's what we'll tackle that question next so keep that in mind um and let me check youtube uh, i don't know what path scribe is uh justin also has an excellent question um uh, Justin's question is pretty quick, so I'll do that one right now. He is asking, how do these tools interact with Cinema's different uh, interpretation of points? So I'll do that uh, very simply with a text spline. And let's just type in some curvier letters. We can see a G, a B, a C, an R. So these are some letters that got, uh, you know, they got a lot of rounding to them. So if I feed in, let's feed them into a smooth and inside of smooth, smooth is the easiest one that I can see the tools running, but we can say zero iteration, so it's kind of like nothing's happening. So if I double click, we can see how all the points are coming in. Now, what is happening is our point input is saying, look at the baked line. Look at whatever cinema is telling us is the final. So if I click back onto the text spline and say, currently you're adaptive mode. I'm gonna say, yes, you're adaptive mode, but only make a new point every 45. And you see, you can get this very low poly look. If I go back in the smooth, you can see that's automatically adapted to that is looking at the baked line that's coming from there. So something that's important to note here is if you put this back to, um, I'm going to put this back to the default and make it editable. And let's go to point mode. So this has nothing to do with our tools. But you can see we've got some very clean Bezier handles that are here to control the text. 
Um, now, you could be like, oh, if I select all these points, it's saying that there's only 106 points. It's like, well, yeah, there's only 106 control points inside of this text. But as far as actual real points, there are way more. And let's see if I can force it to show it. Because at the end of the day, Bezier mode in adaptive, all it's doing is, let's try and zoom like way up on the line. Yeah, so you, it's going to be difficult to see. But if I zoom up, you're going to see that it's like, yeah, look, you can see there's actually an edge right there. So what it's doing is saying every time the line bends more than five degrees, create a new subdivision, create a new subdivision, create. So every five units, if I say one, it's going to, um, it's going to show it here. Maybe it doesn't show it in the viewport. I thought that would update to show it. Oh, it's a Bezier preview of it. If I deselect, we'll see them. But you can actually see how the curve is being created. Now, if I put that back to five degrees, if I feed this into a connect object and then make that editable, no, but that maintained it. If I feed it in a connect object and say current state to object, yeah, that one does it. You see that here, like this doesn't look any different visually, but we've gotten rid of the Bezier handles, but you see that this is what was really happening. Here are how many points were really making up that spline. So if I select them all, you can see that there was actually 674 points that made up this text. And it's all just about how you can control it, like how controllable is it, and uh, how many subdivisions there were. So, it, so to answer the question, whatever this is returning, the utility splines are designed to be able to interpret those lines in different ways. And actually a cool way to show uh, this really specifically is let's grab a circle spline. So a simple circle spline, you know I always make an end side because end side you can tell it exactly how many points there are around. If I make this editable, there's only four points, but if we actually bake it down, actually I don't even have to bake it down, let's bring it back. If I feed that into smooth, go into advanced, you can see that there was actually 36 points that were really making it up. So having done that, that is the baked line input. We are seeing the interpretation. But we built in a couple alternative modes, and one of them is looking at the raw vertex. So if you look at the raw vertex, that's like the control points that the users have. So if I say raw vertex, you'll see that this is now only returning the very four points that came from the original object. It's ignoring the Bezier. Um, inside of resample, you can actually do some cool things here. If I say resample mode, and is I can say um, subdivide mode and I can yeah here I can add subdivisions let me show the tick marks here mm -mm. so you'd see let's make those bigger I've got these tick marks going along and as I add extra subdivisions you can see I'm subdividing ignoring the curve but I can also say go ahead and follow the curve and now you can see I'm creating subdivisions that actually fall on the interpretation of the spline and actually this is actually going to show this really well if I tell this to that's uniform eight I'll say uniform four you see there's a lot fewer points so now as I subdivide you can see it's actually sampling that spline because the incoming spline wasn't it didn't have a very high resolution you can now see that we are now subdividing successfully the not very high resolution version of the spline so you can see that we end up with a series of straight lines with a bunch of tick marks so two ways of fixing that obviously would be we can go back to the original spline and say actually you should be like subdividing a whole bunch so now there's a lot of points for us to sample and you can see our curve is going to follow way better or um if we wanted to skip that I could feed that straight into a smooth spline and add on as many smoothing iterations as I want you can see we get that sharp corner as I add on more and more and more and more and more and more smoothing they eventually will end up with pretty much a perfect circle like correcting for that double clicking you see how uh, we can have those kind of sharp edges sharp edges and then smooth them out okay cool now I'd, this is a good situation to show it might be here's a, a random thing but with counter scale um, some of those points are being smoothed out more than others. So I might have to go really extreme here. But if I start counterscaling more, oh, not stiffness. If I keep on counterscaling more, it's going to start exaggerating the change that we made. And you can end up with some kind of cool looking shapes. So you can see as I keep on pushing, we start getting this wiggly line. And I can also go negative on there. So it's going to start exaggerating it in the negative opposite direction. So you end up with some really interesting shapes. Uh, it's more applicable in some other places, but it's something to keep in mind. You... Um, somebody's asking about Bezier, so that's a good time to do the Bezier spline demo, but let's, I think I have a different version of it here, although the one, some of them, well, what's the best way of saying it? I'll do the Bezier demo from scratch, because I think it's pretty cool. Here, okay, tell me if you've ever done this workflow before, let me pull this all out. So, 
Uh, this is literally, I have done this a lot of times throughout my career and there's probably, there's probably better ways of doing this. Somebody can shout out if you know of a, like a fundamentally better way and potentially better settings. But my typical workflow is I'll go and search Google for, you know, presumably, uh, like commercial, um, commercial or creative commercial free stuff and bring it into Photoshop. And then I'll do some really fancy selections and then I'll convert those to a path inside of Photoshop. And now say export paths to Illustrator, and then you can open that file in Cinema. To me, it's the easiest way of getting kind of a photo to a spline into Cinema. This is a raw spline straight out of Photoshop. So you'll see that what's happened is because of all the curves and detail, there are a ton of points. And I set the settings up to have really high fidelity. So it's almost like trying to trace some of the pixelated edges, etc. Now, a couple things I want to do, make sure that this is a good scale. It always throws me off if I'm playing with a thing. Yeah, I guess it's a good size. Um, a lot of the set, much like cinema builds, I make it so the tools should look good on a default cube sized object. So if you are working on this and the entire thing is like really, really tiny, let me unlock that. If this is like really, really, really tiny. Then a lot of the settings are gonna have to be like really tiny. Like your deviation will have to be really tiny to compensate. So anyway, so here's a mirror. What I'd like to do is be able to make edits to it. So let's optimize the heck out of this thing. Um, I'll make a duplicate of it that we can go back and reference and let's feed this into to start out with I'll make a resample and the resample out of the gate is going to resample every five steps I can double click but that's going to lose a lot of the details I want to maintain where there's like some really sharp corners you'll see here that there's some sharp corners I'd love to keep so I'm actually not going to do a step resample I'll do a actually I don't want to resample I want reduction and I'm going to say optimize. So I'm going to say every, it is now stepping along, and it's a, say, baked line. Um, I'm now stepping along. I can say show the original tick marks. And you see I've actually gotten, there's a lot of points here that are like doubling up on top of each other. So by doing an optimize, I'm getting rid of all these points that are like super on top of each other. So there we go. I've done a little bit of reduction there. Now, I think I'd like to, we've got like these straight edges going. Those could mess us up. So I'm going to feed this into another. Let's do a resample. And this resample is set to step. Let me double click on that and we can get the steps going. I say one, so it's pretty heavily subdivided. But I don't want to lose all those other points because I don't want to like leave the, lose those sharp curves. If I twirl this down, there's a couple of extra settings. And one of them is keep or retain the original points. And now I'm maintaining those original points, which means I've gotten to keep those sharp corners. So now I've resampled those. Now I, t I shall take that and feed it into a smooth. Do I want a smooth? Maybe I do. I'll make a smooth and let's subdivide once and maybe put some smoothing in there. Actually, I don't know if I want any smooth or not. I think we get away without doing any smooth. So Sorry, Smooth, we'll come back to you in a bit. So now we're going to feed this into a tool we haven't used yet in the live stream. And that is the Rocket Bezier tool. Holding on Alt, that will automatically become a parent of what I have selected. And I can double click on the Bezier spline. And you're going to see that our subdivisions look very different than they did before. Suddenly we don't have a bunch of tick marks and every tick mark has an extended line to it. What this tool does is it tries to intelligently convert an object into a Bezier spline for you. So it's like a reverse complexity. Usually if you take a Bezier spline and bake it down, well, there's no going back. This tries to reverse engineer it and bring Bezier handles back. Now, there's a couple, of, it's probably the most technical of the tools, but we got a couple different settings here. We got a tolerance. This is based on the deviation algorithm that we have. So we can say, if we make a really tight tolerance, if I say 0.1, it's like, oh, okay, well, we have to be adhering to the previous line really strictly, meaning not that many points can be gotten rid of. Now, a, a bunch were, if I say, you know, zero, you can see that there are more points. So even at 0.1, it's doing something. But let's tr try and step up a bit. I'm gonna say 0.2, and we can say 0.5, we can say 0.8, and we go back to one, we keep, and then I can keep on going further. I can say, hey, if, if you're allowing for a little bit more wiggle, let's go all the way up to two. Then you see it got rid of even more handles. Um, so now we have even fewer things to try and control uh, in order to control this. Um, let's say that I want to find some, sh I'm going to bring these back and I want to detect sharp edges. We got a couple different ways of doing that. Right now I've got this break tangent. I'm going to bring that down to zero. 
so we can see another one very clearly. We've got detect corner. If I say none, nothing's gonna be there. If I say single corner, I must have done the order of this one a little bit differently than I did. I can get these a little bit better because this is not giving me those sharp angles. I guess I can get them back in using our break tangent. If I start increasing this break tangent, I'm saying if this line and this line are sharper than this angle, then make then break that tangent. So you can see that we're actually starting to get these hard edges back in again. So these little mushroom shapes get to maintain their sharp corner. Meanwhile, if we look at this overall mirror shape, that has gotten you know, way smaller, way cleaner handles. So the point ultimately here is if I take this spline and make it editable, I can go to point mode and you can see that we've converted this to a Bezier spline. And instead of those original, and let's go back to the original object, and you can see that those are adhering to each other very nicely. You see all these points. If the client wanted you to change something here, this is gonna be almost impossible to make any changes. But now we've converted it the best we can to a Bezier spline, meaning I can grab handles and make tweaks to it. And there's very little to work from there. So that's the Bezier spline. Uh, I can demo that a little bit better or like to make it, you know, an extreme example. Let's go back to the original file here and I've got this camera track. So if I were to especially feed this into a smooth, well, let me show you. If we go to point mode, this would be very difficult to manipulate and clean up. Like Cinema's got some tools, like some brushes that you might be able to do a little bit with it. But if I take this and say, hey, I want to smooth this out. So I'll say smoothing. And let's do a bunch of smoothing iterations, make it nice and smooth, counter scale. So it's still the original shape quite nicely. And then I feed that smooth into a Bezier spline, double click so we can see the handles. If I allow for some deviation, and let's see how far we push it. I don't wanna, I don't wanna go so far that we lose like the shape of the original spline. I'll copy this out so we can compare. So actually that's, that's matching quite nicely. Now, would, would you want to control that spline or now let's make this Bezier editable or would you want to control this spline with these handles where now I can select any one point and move that off to the side and then this one, okay, that bump is too big so now I can pull this down and let that get rounded out. So we've converted that back to, yeah, it's a parametric way of converting something back to a Bezier spline to give yourself handles to be able to work from a more reasonable spline. So yeah, the ability to bring those back again, very cool. I really like that one. Um, so, <laughs> Nicholas is saying, you must have missed the earlier part, but you got a exceeded point cap, but if you clicked over right, it worked. The uh, basic version, and here I'll even just show you um, from this file, undo, um, I can break this really easily by, if I say, hey, this can only handle 100 points, then that means I have now exceeded my point count. And you can actually see here, you see the spline is going to return the first 100 points and it'd be like, whoop, no more. The idea here is you can accidentally throw in a ridiculous spline or maybe you change like a subdivision setting and you're like, hey, give me 2 billion points. Cinema is probably not going to like that. So we built a safety tool in, which is this point cap. And we know that most of the time people are like, well, it's like you're going to feed in a spline. You're going to be like, okay, I'm pretty sure my machine can handle this. So we did put this override button. You also get this little X right here. And if you double click on the icon, it's going to look at the point count, update your point cap to be exactly what your current point count is and return everything. So that's the idea there. So it's just a safety measure. We want to make it as frictionless for the user as possible. And that's why you can just double click on the icon override. Okay. Um, let, I'm gonna jump into my demo folder that is so I ultimately I make a demo folder and that will end up getting shipped along with the tool so utilities fine comes with 14 different files but while I'm working on a tool I just have like a raw folder of things I look cool and a lot of those don't make the cut for like a good final demo but that doesn't mean they're not fun to take a look at now I included it because of me using the um the file so often I included the link inside of it, but there's a website called Vector World Map and it's a, they say it's a free map that you can use. And essentially it's a giant vector map um, with like incredible detail on the entire world. So I've got that file right here. So we can take a look at that because it's pretty fun to show off some other settings. See, it's a world map and it's got 
tons of points. If I select them all, there's 55,000 points with like tons of detail of the entire world. But this is, we were using this internally a lot as a testing file for making thing, making sure things were using because it felt like a good, you know, it's not the craziest spline to feed in, but you definitely get a lot of control um, and, you know, a lot of points, a lot of segments. So let's take a look at feeding some different tools in here. If I feed in a nice straightforward smooth, then instantly, I'm going to keep it highlighted so you can see it. Maybe it would be a good idea to say... Maybe, maybe not. I'm trying to think of for the purpose for the live stream, if I should say renderer, viewport display, spline thickness two. Yeah, there, I've, I think thickened the light up at least for the live stream. Um, so you can see right away that if I zoom in, that we've got like these really detailed coastlines, but if I start smoothing it, then we can start smoothing those away. Now we already demoed a bunch about, you know, you're, you're losing some fidelity here. You see, if I keep on going and going and going, actually this is kind of cool, is if we keep on adding more and more and more and more iterations, eventually the whole thing's gonna get really, really super duper smooth. Um, but let's say that you just wanna add more detail to this overall spline. If I zoom up here, it's like, okay, these things start getting a little chunky. I want these to be rounded, but if I try and round them, they go away. So let's do that, you know, one of my favorite workflows, which is subdivide the input. And I'm going to subdivide just once and say override. So now this has jumped up to 110,000 points. But now if I add a single iteration of smoothing, I didn't lose too much f fidelity, but you can see that the smoothness here is way higher. Uh, we're going to push the limits here, but I can say subdivide twice and override again, and now I could do two levels of smooth, and now this line is incredibly smooth everywhere, but you will see that we have jumped up to um, 220,000 points to make up the overall shape. Um, but that is definitely a workflow that I like to do. Now, moving on, there's a setting that is inside... It's built into a couple different tools, but it's also built into smooth and it's called minimum length. And what this setting is going to do is, um, let's temporarily turn this off. You're gonna see that we got all these little lakes, like Canada is just lousy with lakes everywhere. But it could be that you know what you're working on, you don't want to see all these tiny little ones. You only wanna see like major land masses. So we've got a setting called minimum length. So if I say zero, we see everything. But as I start increasing the minimum length, splines or segments that are shorter in diameter um, or like shorter in perimeter than eight are going to disappear. And I can zoom out here and keep on going further and further. So we can say, increase the minimum smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So smaller ones are disappearing. So probably there's a good kind of world map. We don't want to lose Madagascar, but we can keep on going further and further and further. It's just you're removing shorter and shorter. And finally, we're going to be left with the two major land masses. And finally, this one giant spline. And so we can erase those out parametrically. So that's a pretty cool setting there. Now, the reason that's built into smooth by default is, let me show you. If we say zero, we're going to have all these tiny little lakes. Let's zoom in here. And you see, we got this nice little lake if i start adding in smoothing iterations it's going to shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink smaller and smaller and smaller and if we do enough iterations eventually it's, it's going to become a point in space it's so small but you can imagine if you're cloning on here if you're rendering it you're like wait why is there a white pixel right there so that would be that would be a pain if those were existing so that's why we made minimum length if i turn on the minimum length that will now disappear so it's even in the beginning you see like this lake right here that one is existing but as I add more smoothing iterations, actually even just one, that's enough for it to have shrunk less than that. As I go further and further, more and more will disappear because they've gotten tinier. So just another setting um, to be able to get rid of those if need be. Um, so what are some more things to talk about here? Let's switch our smooth to be our reduction mode. And this is a, another really good demo. If I say, you know, like a deviation reduction of 0.1. Again, let's take a look at our overall spline here. We're kind of zoomed out, but if I turn this on and off, do you see any visual difference between <laughs> white and yellow? But I don't see any difference between those two. So it's like, okay, cool, we didn't lose anything. But if I click on reduction, you're gonna see that we removed almost 20% of the points. So almost 20% of the points were so, the lines were so straight that we can't even tell that they were there. Um, so, you know, good to get rid of those, but you can keep on increasing your tolerance more and more and more, and you start getting, um, I don't know what the right word when it's 
a spline would be. But essentially, it starts looking a little bit more like low poly. You see how those keep on reducing. And the looks, it, it looks kind of cool. You get this low poly look on the overall shape just by reducing it. And every mode is going to give you a slightly different output. Um, so uh, let's talk about some other things we might be able to do, though. Uh, I'm going to reduce this a decent amount because I don't need to see all these. And um, let's not go that far. Let's remove, well, we'll only move up to one. And I want to get rid of all these tiny little things. So I will throw this. There we have another tool that we haven't talked about yet, but we have cleanup. And cleanup will remove redundant points and it will also give you the option of that minimum length. So I'm going to remove a whole bunch of these. So kind of a fun little demo. Actually, I'm going to get rid of a lot of things. Everything up to Madagascar. Okay. So now I'm going to feed this into the resample. And the resample has a bunch of really cool modes that we haven't talked about yet. So we can resample it based on a step, which is just like it's going to step along every five units, create another one. Um, let me double click and get the uh, tick marks going. Um, and we got count. Count is just going to set a certain number of points on every single spine. So it's like, okay, every single one of these is 100 points, no matter what. That is useful in specific circumstances. Um, we already talked about subdivide a bunch, but let's talk about random step because this one's kind of fun. What random step is going to do is it's essentially going to walk along a spline. It's going to walk, 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 and then create a new point, and it's going to do it randomly. I'm currently telling it that there can be up to, it's between zero and 10. So you can see here we get a whole bunch of tiny ones and then a big gap right there. So I could say, hey, a minimum of one and a maximum of 55. So then you can see that I've made something pretty low point count and they might get close, they might get farther away. And I can twirl this down. You get a couple extra settings, mostly for randomness. And you can see we've got a seed here. We have our little randomize button. So I can keep on clicking the randomize. But something, we've had you know this type of randomize button before. But something I thought of when we snuck in last second on this tool is the idea of this animate parameter. And what I can do with that is type in five, or I can type in any number. And essentially, these are frames. How many frames until the utility splines should automatically trigger a new random seed. So that means if I hit play, this will automatically update. I'll keep it highlighted so we can see it. This will automatically update every five frames. So you can get a stop motion looking motion. So we could say one, and now it's like every single frame, but it's gonna be super jittery. We could say two, which will give you a little bit of a stop motion look, 30 frames per second. So now it's once every 15 frames is jittering. But you know, just for demo purposes, saying five, you can see, okay, those jitter around. Those look pretty good there. We could do a larger gap. So I could say, okay, minimum of five and a maximum of 111. So that's even lower poly potentially and that you get these a bunch of pops going. So then you can imagine taking that and feeding it into a, a smooth. So I say smooth those uh, and we'll do the same trick. I'll subdivide, uh, we could resample. I'll just say a step. So now we're stepping through resampling and then smooth those out. So now we get a curvy version of those final lines. And you see, we get this nice, you know, scribbly looking version of the outline of all the continents. And this was just layering up through a reduction and a cleanup and a resample and then a smooth and they're just ready to go. So yeah, very, very, you know, these are utility spines. You can layer them up and use them however you need to at whatever point. We could then feed this through another reduction and remove any points here that aren't very needed either. So yeah, layering them up, very fun. Um, Bihavana? Um, can I use it to deform a spline like with a random, like with a random on point mode? Can you ask that in a slightly different way? I'm not sure I'm following the question exactly. Can you use it to deform a spline like with a random on point mode? Yeah, ask it in a little bit more detail of a way. Uh, checking for other questions. Um... Point cap. Oh, I, I, uh, barking, I agree. Like, uh, I have oftentimes typed in a number in cinema, which made it either too small or too large. And cinema's like, I'll get back to you on that in like three days. So, yeah, those point caps are nice. Um, do, do, do. Oh, Caspian, uh, I don't know the workflow for getting something back into Illustrator. So, like, I could take this and, you know, it's not, if we're not animating it, I could feed this crazy, you know, keep in mind what the original world map looked like. Feed this to a Bezier. And if I double click, you see that I've now reduced, I'll make that editable now. I've now reduced that crazy original world map to 252 control points that are like pretty easy to manipulate and change however I want to. Um, as far as getting back into 
Um, does anybody know uh, how to get back into Illustrator? I think you can export certain exports do see splines and then um, like I think I've exported splines back using DXF. You might be able to do it with some STLs as well. Uh, I know there's also a method where you could apply sketch and tune and then you can output it possibly as Illustrator. You can export splines as Illustrator. Um, but if anybody specifically remembers, oh yeah, and Dean is saying if you have, if you go to Cineversity, you can get uh, ArtSmart and that also has a function to be able to do it. But yeah, somebody's saying STL works. So I don't know if, it, if any of those bring in the Bezier handles, it might bring them baked in, but uh, yeah. Um, and Zach is saying that they're under export, there's a Illustrator option. File, export, Illustrator 8, settings. So I don't know if you, we need to do anything fancy there. Um, but yeah, there's definitely options. Um, so let's jump in and look at some of my more random things here. Um, cross stitch, no. Oh, here's the, the most straightforward example ever. Here's like one of those funky fonts that comes, uh, it's GG font, but we, let's feed that into simplifier and I'll just, uh, we can, I'm subdividing based on step now. So there's a lot of subdivisions and I can say, Hey, just start adding in some layers of smoothing. And there we go. We get a nice clean curvy looking font. So it's like, Hey, GG might actually be kind of usable there again. Everything's parametric. So I can type in a different word here and it'll filter up through the simplifier and then through the extrude. And yep, that just works. Let's smooth it. I'm going to smooth it some more. I'm going to do some counter scale. And let's talk about the stiffness. The stiffness setting is just kind of an override where it's like it's going to blatantly transition from one shape to the other. Uh, there's going to be a blink right there because two spines are crossing over each other. So I'm just going to ignore that. It's just what happened to happen right here. Um, so an extrude doesn't like when the spine passes over itself. Um, but anyway, if I crank the stiffness, stiffness all the way up to 100, I can move inside and there's a fields checkbox. <laughs> I can't believe we put so much work into making fields work here for this one specific setting. But if you turn on use fields, then you're gonna get a new tab called stiffness field. And now I can create something like a linear field. And if I grab this linear field, I can pass it. It's gonna be subtle, but look at the text. You're gonna see a transition from the smooth state to the rough state as the field passes through it. So obviously you can use any type of field or any modifiers on top of that that you wanted, but yep, you can transition between those two different states. So that's fun. Um, what's this? Ah, that's not much of anything. This is just that random demo, but on a helix spline, the random resample. Um, that one doesn't work too well. Um, I don't think I have anything specific to show from here. Actually, I guess the one thing that's kind of neat here is like, here's another thing I just downloaded off the internet. It is a map of the world and every state has been given its own outline, but I can, I can take the entire null and throw it into the utility splines and it will see all of them. It's filtering through finding all those children. And in this case, I have a very similar setup. So if I hit play, it's going to be this jittery animation. Actually, look, this is funny. This demo is old enough that I have this seed keyframes. That's because we hadn't built this tool in. So I'm going to delete that keyframe. And I'm going to say animate every fifth frame now. And now we get a nice stop motion look without any keyframes. Um, uh, world map, we talked about that already. Slicer, uh, we talked about that a bit. Here's a weird one. Um, I guess it's not much of a demo here, but I, I, I took the world map and I made a whole bunch of copies of it and I smoothed it out a bunch. And then I fed in a rope simulation. And you know, if I hit play, you're gonna see that we get this lovely and running you know, really quickly uh, simulation of all these ropes falling and just turning into strings. So that one would be really cool if baked and you know, run in reverse or something, or those all form like the continents. Um, this one, it's gonna be, no, I don't, that was a practice one. This one, I talk about this one in the demo, I'm not gonna step through the entire thing, but in this one I made a field force where there's a big uh, circle traveling around. So the idea here is, let me turn this off. So here's a, a spline and I'm running simulation on it. So that that's the raw simulation running. This has nothing to do with my tools, but, I guess something we haven't really talked about too much here is here is a smoothing spline. And what we've been doing is we've been 
seeing the source as the children, meaning you have to take a spline and make it a physical child of the spline of the object. But what if you want, what if you don't want that to be part of the hierarchy? Well, I can hide the original spline and say, actually, I want to link to something else. So I can say, hey, this hidden spline, bring that in. You are looking at as if you're consuming that. And then I am now subdividing and smoothing that spline out. I've got one thing that's just a little bit smoothed. I got another one that's very smoothed out. So very different looks of the same simulation. They're both referencing the same simulation, but that means this cloner sets to blend mode with 15 steps in between, and I'm assigning a color to it. I can turn that on now. And now I've got, it's not gonna run super quick because of all those blends, but if I hit play now, look at the super crazy effect um, where you know 15 different iterations of the same simulation uh, each assigned their own crazy color, and now the field force is going to make them spin around the overall spline. So, pretty crazy. Cool. I mean, it, it's effects that it would be very difficult for, to, for me to imagine how I would do otherwise. So, as we keep going, as with almost anything inside of Cinema 4D, when a new tool comes out, it's like, man, we haven't even thought of all the things that we can do with this yet. So, yeah, that's a fun one. Um... Let me check questions again. Uh, I was curious if you built into this util utility the ability to take a line or circle spline, for example, and then deform along the various axes and then art direct deformation. Um, no, this, th this tool has nothing to do with deformation. You can smooth out something you've already deformed. So as a example, um, let's take a helix spline and I'll make it way taller. And then right now I'm gonna say no subdivisions and this now has a subdivision of 100. So there's exactly 100 points traveling along the entire thing. So then we can create a uh, random and the random I'll say that you are deforming based on the points. And now this is independently on X, Y and Z taking points and deforming them and moving them into weird wacky places. Uh, if we change this to noise mode and we make the scale, I think, really small. And yeah, I think the animation speed should be okay. So I'm going to say, actually, let's leave the scale up. And I'll say indexed. So now each point is completely independent. So now we could take these and say each one of them is going to deform three times the amount. So you can see we got all this crazy deformation. So, so far, not using any of the utility splines at all. So now we've got a nice coherent deformation here. Here's something that maybe you didn't know. If I take, I might need a duplicate of it, but if I make a duplicate of the spline, so here's the original helix, hide that. And now inside of the random, I'm gonna say, hey, look at the original shape of the helix. And now you can see that, look, there's a fall off along the entire thing. Because by default, the shape is along the spline, meaning I should be able to create a curve and reshape this. So wherever the power is up, everything's being applied. So I could say, actually, I would like to curve it up in the middle and not on the edges. So now you can see the, deforma the deformation is happening in the middle and not on the left and the right. Um, and you know, we can change the curves and have these apply however we want. So do all that, make it a little bit stronger. So anyway, you get some really cool deformation, kind of lightning-y looking. And then take this overall shape and I say, okay, now I will feed the result of that into a smooth. And let's do our usual workflow where I say, hey, I'd like to subdivide that maybe twice. And now add on a couple of smoothing iterations. And now I can get these nice scribbly looking lines because we get that random deformation. So we have complete random motion of the spline but then smoothing it out. I, I don't think there's any way you could really get this deformation just using built-in cinema tools, but now you can see how it's working really well there. Now, to bring in something that's kind of cool, we've been working on a bunch of tools for Maxon at Rocket Lasso. And if you have the Maxon One subscription, then you should have access to all of these already. Um, if you don't have the Maxon One subscription, I think you still get one of these but anyway i'm going to show you these because why not um there's two new two, there are two new tools uh that we that got released this month i think and is the dash spline and the trim so both of these we made here um but they're available to everybody 
uh, with Max on WAM. So I'll show you Dash Spline first. So it is, uh, it, these, you should think of these as spline deformers. So if I take the Dash Spline and I drop as a child of the smooth, you can see that it's made a dotted dashed line out of it. Like check that out, a dotted line, like parametrically on top of cinema. It's still a spline. It's now deforming the smooth and now it's a series of tiny, tiny little segments. If I say that the length should be longer, we're gonna have fewer of them. And then I guess the way it's moving, I'm gonna turn off the movement just so you can see. I can also say that this has a bit of a rate to it. Let's say five, no, it's too slow, 55. Now you can see that the, the dash spline is automatically traveling through. There's a bunch of additional settings that are pretty cool. Um, like we can change this to custom mode and we can do a custom pattern. So you can see that I can keep on adding additional settings here. And like, and I can say on, off, on, 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 off, on, off. And you can see that's the pattern that's going to repeat through it. You can set the overall count and everything. So, you know, it just works really well. Uh, so dash spline, pretty cool. And you can see how it's, you know, works perfectly along with our tools. This is gonna be a little too jittery to see the coherence of the dash, but yeah, it works well. And now something that's pretty cool is we've got this trim spline, which is pretty straightforward in what it does but you see we've got this nice wiggling spline here if i grab the trim i can say hey where does it start where does it end i can just pull back on that and start erasing out the spline so here you can imagine that at the beginning you want nothing keyframe that at the end i want 100 percent keyframe that and then hit play and now that will animate on while wiggling so a very simple way of trimming a spline. Technically, there's some workarounds. If you spend a bunch of time, you could make most spline do that, but here's a straightforward version of it automatically working. It does more than that as well, where instead of keyframing that, let's just look at a small section of it. And now I've got that offset and we've got set to loop. So let's say over the course of 30 frames, it's going to loop. So now that's looping every second uh, doing exactly that shape. It does a lot more than that and it will work with multiple splines, etc. cetera. But, um, yeah, it's a really fun modifier. So yeah, two additional tools that actually pair really well with the utility splines and with Slicer and with Ricochet. So all these things combine in really, really cool ways. Let's see, check in for questions again. Uh, I, I guess uh, because there's more people hanging out in the chat, I'll just do a, a little recap of a couple different things. First of all, the main goal right now is just to talk about the new utility splines from Rocket Lasso. Uh, more exciting new, well, that came out today. There is a $10 off discount code that you'll see in the description below. It's just launch party, one word, I think all caps on Gumroad, you get $10 off. Important to note, if you are supporting on Patreon, even if you begin right now, if you support at a $10 level, you get an $11 coupon off. At $20 level, you get 21. At a $50 level, you get $51 coupon off. So it's a great way of supporting Rocket Lasso and getting a really good discount code. And more news, next week, I'm going to start Rocket Lasso Live Season 5, where we'll just be answering questions for everybody. More news. Mm, I can't. I, I have to go make sure I can check. But I did work on a movie recently that isn't quite out in theaters, but I was very excited to be able to work on it, so that's cool. I worked on part of a title sequence. Um, I mentioned Half Res, just a save the date early. I know it's a long ways away. It's not until September, but it's going to be September 8th, which is a Friday. It's going to be a big one. It's a 10-year anniversary, so that's really cool. If you have a question, repost it in. Uh, I definitely want to get to every question that I can. Um, a couple details here. I'm just going to throw it out because you guys are like my more insider community who come and hang out regularly in live streams and whatnot. I will say, um, well, we've been working really hard on this tool. Uh, we started it over a year ago. Uh, we had to work on some other things, but we came back to it. But it's five different plugins. We work really hard. You can see that there's a lot of love and detail, you know, things like being able to do tick marks and the double clicking icons. And we just try and think of every possible use case people might have for it. So I will say Rocket Lasso, I think we charge a, a premium for our tools. I don't think that's like insane, but you know, we don't, they're not cheap. These aren't throwaway tools where like, oh, everybody can buy them for 20 bucks. So yeah, this tool is $120. Um, and that is not going to be something that is super, you know, if you're a casual hobbyist, you know, it's, it's probably not a tool for you. But if you are doing client work and suddenly you're like, oh wait, this tool is gonna like save me a ton of time. I can do things I couldn't do otherwise. Like it's gonna take me forever to fix the spline and suddenly you can turn it into a Bezier spline and, and be able to work from it again. Like there's a lot of utility in that. So that's why I figure the market for this is a little bit more so than like a casual, like daily render person, just, you know, doing it as a hobby. So, um, so anyway, I'm saying I, I know that 
Rocket Lasso charges a decent premium, but at the same time, like we're trying to survive as a company and be able to keep on doing the free live streams and the free tutorials and the free what's new videos in cinema. So, you know, that's the trade off we have to do for that type of thing. Um, but also we get like almost zero refunds on anything. I think everybody who buys our stuff, like all, all of the reviews on Gumroad are all five stars and everything. So I think we make really, really good tools for people that are trying to really solve their problems. But I know a lot of people, you know, I'll say like the casual people who are hobbyists or whatnot, like people are like, oh, these are too expensive. It's like, I get that. And I, w I wish I could make the tools super cheap uh, and the company survive. But it, I don't think that's the case. We've looked at the numbers and the ones that we've worked harder on and are bigger and a little, a little more expensive do a little bit better for us. So just throwing that there for everybody who's here um, who like knows me and the stuff I do a little bit more and like all the different things we try and do for the community for free. So these are the one things that we're like, ah, we need to ask money for those. Um, so yeah, throwing that out there. Uh, we got a couple other little tools uh, in the works that we, that might be like way cheaper and be a little bit more fun, but uh, I have no idea when those will come out. So no promises, no previews on any of that. Um, no, 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 no. Bind spline? Yeah. Um, so this one actually was driving me absolutely crazy a little ways back until I finally figured out what the problem was. And this might be a bug in cinema, or maybe it's a bug that it happens to work. I don't know. But... Uh, I earlier you saw me do the demo using Ricochet. Um, is it worth doing that demo again? What time is it? Eh, I'm not going to do the demo again. We got more to talk about. Anyway, I made a big blob of a character. I made a Ricochet, which is another plugin of ours. And I had it bounce around inside the character. So this is one big giant continuous spline. And then I made I took some of the mocap data that's inside the asset browser, and if we say go. Uh, go to reference pose, it's going to go to the T pose, which you see is going to match like this crazy one giant spline. The one detail that I didn't know is you have to make sure that you are in a Bezier spline. If you go to these other modes, it just doesn't work. And like I said, I don't know if it's a bug that it does work or if it's a bug that doesn't work in other modes. But in any case, if you're in Bezier, what I can do is select all of these joints by middle mouse button. If you use a middle mouse button as a button, you can select the object and all of its children. So that's a really cool little uh, tip right there. And then holding down control or command, I can also select the spline, go to character, bind, and now it should hopefully have successfully bound the spline to the bones, to the joints. So um, sometimes it can be a little funky. You can see that this ankle bends in a kind of weird spot. For my purposes, I don't care about that. But you can now see that we have a instant like character like ready to animate with like almost no effort so this is being deformed by via a skin deformer so now let's take that animated character and feed that through a smooth and you see now we get this little scribbly guy which is like adorable like right out of the gate like look at that look at him he's so happy um but then we can start pushing this kind of thing even further which can get pretty which i, I think is really great uh, some things we can do. So instead of smoothing it right away, I'm going to resample. So I'll set this to resample mode. And currently, I'm setting it to a step of five. Um, but you'll see that if it, it's a step of five, that's constantly changing. And I think that's probably because as the character stretches, the splines are getting longer. Therefore, it's getting more steps on it. So that mode doesn't work. So instead, I'll set this to a set count. Now that's if the character had exactly 100 points, but let's try 1,000 points. That's almost matching the overall character. Let's try 2,000 points. Better still, I'll just jump up to 5,000. I'm making this demo up as I go, so it may be a little dangerous. But if I click on advanced, you can see it's exactly 1,000 points, or I'm sorry, 5,000 points all the time. So it's pretty static. They'll still slide around a little bit because he is stretching and unstretching. But let's see if this works. I don't know if it will. Um, Let's do that uh, random deformation again. So I'm gonna say after it's resampled, I want to deform each of the different random points. Let's say that they are indexed and it'll be noise-based and they should deform very little. So I'll say five by five by five and have them be UV-based with an animation speed. What I wanna do is I wanna see a coherent speed Maybe index this bad. Okay, no indexed. Animation speed up a little bit. That eh, seems a little jittery. Global. And then if they're not indexed, the scale's probably relevant. 
Uh, that's probably fine kind of for what I'm going for. So let's deform a little bit more. Let's do 11, 11, 11. So now we've got a scribbly guy, like a nice waving scribbly guy, but that can now be fed through another smooth. And in this case, I'll say don't smooth yet, subdivide. And now we'll do one or two smoothing layers. And now we've got a more coherent scribbly guy. Let's change this to a uh, automatic. No. Let's make it purple. Oop, it's not filtering through there. Um, colorize, none. No, I had the wrong spline selected. That would explain it. So yeah, now we got a, actually I colored the show up too well in the background. Brighten it up a bit. Um, so yeah, the crazy pink guy here. But we, you know, we, there's so many different ways we could resample this or set them, uh, set things. But anyway, the point being is you can see how quickly we can layer up a few things and get a very different look of a character um, to make effects that, yeah, I, I don't know how I would have made this otherwise, like make a smooth line traveling through the entire thing. So yeah, that that's a fun little random demo that I couldn't figure out how to put into any of the mainline videos. Um, yeah, very Gumby. Um, edge to spline, smooth car. We talked about that. Smoothing ricochet, we might have... Oh, yeah, that's um, very similar to one of the demos we did earlier where um, there's a raw ricochet bouncing through. We already stepped through that. And then I can smooth that out. And then it looks like, for some reason, I put into a second smooth and then fed that back through a volume with another... Uh, smooth the former and then we end up with these cool curvy lines traveling through it just kind of a weird interesting look stiffness field now we don't need to do that one actually that was something that we made during live streams in season four here's okay this is this is gonna take a little while to load and i don't think this is practical at all nobody else try and do this um but what it's doing is really weird and kind of fun so this was a idea I had, which does technically work, but what I want to do is without using simulation, make it so that I could fill a shape with a bunch of lines and have them not intersect with each other. And this is the rig I came up with, which is like completely absurd. So let me step through here and see if we get to work. Um, so I've got, it's the same thing again, where I've got a ricochet. So I've got this geometry fed through a volume so you can see you know pretty low poly and then it gets consumed and the the other plugin my other plugin ricochet which i love uh is bouncing a line around inside of it now there's no intelligence behind that line like they'll just pass right through each other so what i did is i'm saying okay take that line and su uh, subdivide it change it to a step of four and then run a single smoothing iteration on it and then after i've done that take a push apart effector, which normally you don't use for clones. We can actually use it on point, on points as well by changing the deformation to point. And you say, push all the points apart from each other. So if I turn on the push apart, suddenly they're all like, oh no, we're intersecting. Um, now, if I were to feed that directly into the sweep, you're gonna see that it's very forcefully pushing a point away, but they are attempting to dodge. So what the concept ends up being is like, iterating and doing it again and again and again. So I'm going to say, okay, smooth it again, subdivide it again, and then push it apart again, and then smooth it again, and then push it apart, and then smooth it and push and smooth and push and smooth. And I go all the way through there again and again and again. And by sheer iteration, it is now making a very smooth result that all the points have gotten pushed away from each other. But it takes like 30 seconds for the scene file even to load because of all this math. And I would never, ever, ever, ever want to hit play on this. But anyway, it's kind of a fun exercise. But you can see it's even like looping around and whatnot. There's a chance that that could even be like built as a standalone tool. Because if, if this was optimized internally instead of like all these layers of deformation, then it could probably run not super fast, but better. But uh, kind of a kind of a fun, weird one. Um, here is, oh, let's pull this out as a raw shape. We can just play around with it a bit. I'll keep the extrude because that'll save us some time. Um, so yeah, here's a, another like random ornamental element. Uh, I think I like just found a nice image on eBay. Um, and again, we can take this and clean, you know, it's up absolute mess. You can see it's been converted and we got like all these extra points everywhere. So 
just making this and you know if we extrude it it's going to be like awful or you, you, you actually you can see like it's broken in a bunch of places and deselecting and a you can just see how like awful this is looking so let's pull that out and do a couple basic things a similar workflow to what i did before let's throw that into a reduction optimize and we'll step every oh i think i gotta remember that this is a really tiny one select it all make a cube yeah you can see it's really small so for our own sanity i'll select all of them scale and make it uh, a bit bigger okay okay so now zooming up we've got optimize that's somewhat helpful uh, maybe even further one yeah so now i got rid of a bunch of those points that were kind of perfectly overlapping each other and then i'll feed that into a new um i think i'll resample no i'll do a smooth directly no i want to retain points so i gotta do a resample yeah i'll resample that and i would like it to do a step subdivision every one but i also want to keep the original points and maybe a step of 0.5 So that, yeah, so is it even smaller than that, point one? Oh, I have it clicked on original point, sorry. So here's the result. So you see I've added way too many points. Put that back to one. Um, okay, now you see I got nice even subdivision while maintaining my original points. So it's important for your smoothing if you want to maintain a shape really well that you want all this to be very kind of clean. So now if I take that and feed that result into a smooth, and I might even subdivide by one, and now we can just start adding in iterations. And then at a certain point, like you can just see like all those bumps disappear and look how smooth and clean that that overall shape has suddenly become. Um, if you're inclined, I could counter scale and that's gonna bring some of that shape back. Um, you gotta be careful, especially during an extrude. Like if any lines overlap each other, the extrude's not gonna like it. Let's see if, no, it's not happening. Let me show you, I can force it to happen. If I keep on counter scaling further, you see as soon as those two lines cross over each other, the extrude won't like it. But just as a, just as a fun exercise, if we take the counter scale and I keep on pushing it, you can see I can push it further and further. We can start getting like some super wacky shapes. You can also go negative on it and like exaggerate the directions that they were traveling. Um, which, you know, it does make for some kind of cool sharper edges but i don't think we need much or any counter scale keep in mind we've also got this minimum length so there might be yeah you see there's little details here that maybe you want to maybe you don't in this case i don't think i do so i'll keep on increasing until anything i think might be harming the overall shape goes away and there you go now we've got a nice final smoothed out shape we could go a step further and put in a bezier i don't think that's strictly necessary for what we're doing i can feed that now into this extrude and there we go a nice clean extrude if i Push that back further so we can ooh, 100 let's do five uh yeah look nice and smooth n b so we can see the edges nice and clean geometry all the way around the entire thing perfect controllable uh parametric the original thing is there unmodified um and then i could push it further potentially like the extrude takes a little time to run so let's feed uh if i double click here you can see that you know we've got an even point count, very kind of clean all the way around the entire thing. But we might be able to get rid of some of those. So I'll feed that into a reduction. So it's on deviation. You can see it's gotten rid of like a lot of the geometry, which is by default here. Like obviously it's made it very low poly, which maybe that's a good thing. Like if you're gonna be viewing this from really far away, like you don't need you don't need all the extra those extra polygons. And if I go to advanced, you can see that we've dropped this down to six percent of the original point count, and the shape is still super duper maintained, like from a distance. So, like even for like doing um, some LOD, some level of detail stuff, like that could actually be super helpful. But you know, if we zoom up again, obviously it's not going to have the fidelity that we potentially want. So uh, I'll double click so we can see our edges, and I'll say okay maybe point 0.1. So now you can see it's brought a ton of the points back. It looks pretty good from a distance here. Even here, like I, I'm not seeing the polygons too much. Definitely, you know, there are going to be some, but it's looking pretty good there. If I hit NB, you can see how many fewer points there are overall. So super handy there. And you can imagine, I, mm, I mean, the point count's kind of random here. I wouldn't know how well it's going to work. But yeah, that cleaned up a lot right there. Um, push it to any number. We also, you know, I could drop even lower, like 0.05. And now it's going to bring back a bunch more points. And even, you know, after all of that, if I click on here, this is still only 31% of the original point count. 
and this is looking pretty dang good. So it's only the areas that were not very curvy got rid of the points that weren't needed. So layer, 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 get something really nice, a really great end result for you to be able to work with and do whatever you need to. Um, and if we want to just push it that last little step, we can try throwing that into a bezier. Um, this one, I'm going to say 0.5. We got to be decently. It, there's a lot of really thin lines here. If they crisscross over each other, it's not going to like it. But if I double click on here, you can see how much it has reduced everything. So if I make that editable, you remember the original spline. And now I can just click here and have a very clean edge that I can manipulate however I need to. So a lot of power right there, layering things up. Um, is that because? Uh, yeah, one of, one of the lines overlap. Oh, yeah, right there. You can see that the Bezier wasn't quite. We had to increase the accuracy to make sure that those didn't quite overlap because we got these very thin lines. Uh, so if I jump into 0.25, but there's going to be a lot more handles now. But anyway, you know, you see how the layers and layers and layers and combines and you end up with a really cool final controllable shape. Um, uh, Shane is asking about angle threshold. This particular shape doesn't have much in the way of sharp angles, so it, it's not a good demo for it. We can see that we've got uh, we got two different set, two very important different settings for finding sharp angles. So let me, for our own purposes, let me just open up a new file, view it from the front, and draw a spline manually. Now, if I make sort of a curvy shape and then I make a hard angled shape and then we suddenly go to a curvy shape and then we make it hard angled again and then curvy again so I've now got a spline that's got like sharp edges and then curvy edges what I will do is you know right this <laughs> It's already a very clean bezier, so there's not much of a point here. So I'm going to intentionally mess it up. I will do so by feeding it into a... I don't just right-clicking and saying current state object works, but let me try that. Yes, actually, that did work. So you can see it's been baked down. So we've lost our nice bezier handles. Um, and we could even make it this worse. I could subdivide it even further. Um, but assuming you've gotten... Let's say you got from, from a client or something that they had some really clean Bezier lines and now they've baked it down. Where it's like, oh, this is almost controllable, but it's going to be a pain in the butt to work from. So with that being the case, now let's feed that directly into a Bezier. Double click. And you can see... Well, let's turn off all the settings. I say none and none. So you can see here that it is trying... To, it's making a curve out of everything. Like everything is like, okay, it's a curve, it's a curve, it's a curve. Um, trying to smooth it all out. Depending on our deviation... Uh, we can have fewer, more or fewer handles. So you can see that if I make this editable, that we've gotten back to a reasonable number of controls as far as handles are concerned. So that's pretty cool. But um, to specifically answer your question, we have some important tools for detecting angles. Two completely different algorithms. So it's detect corner and break tangent. Break tangent is the straightforward one where if I start increasing this angle, as soon as two lines would would have been without the tangent be sharper than this angle it's going to break the tangent automatically so you can see that those were detected as super sharp angle you know these were detected as sharp angles they were around 90 degrees or 110 degrees so those have now detected those sharp angles so that works pretty well that was another one so we have to go pretty far to find that one alternatively i get rid of that we have detect corner so what detect corner is going to do is say hey, without the Bezier spline, was, it's, say it's looking at this point, it's going to say, like, is at least one of my edges a completely straight line? Essentially, well, yeah, is one of my edges a completely straight line? So let me click single edge. And you can see instantly, just by clicking that, it's like, oh, wait, at, yeah, totally. At, at least one of my edges was a completely straight line. So without even worrying about break tangent, it detected all of those as having a straight edge and therefore essentially perfect, perfectly returned it to us. Uh, you can also do two edges. And what two edges is going to do is if one of the edges is curved, but the other one is straight, then it's like, oh, no, you don't count. Both of your edges need to be broken in order for it to work. So like right here, one straight edge, but then one curved edge. So it's a different way of detecting different corners depending on your shape. So, so yeah, there I was able to bring it back again. We could probably even push the tolerance further to get fewer handles. You see it's you know, more controllable, but losing your original shape a little bit more. But yeah, totally bring them back with Bezier. Mm -mm -mm -mm. let's see oh yeah the previous i think you're talking about the thing from a while ago the iteration could be used for bio simulations yeah push apart rig uh, a push apart rig would definitely be 
useful um, because the tools in cinema, you have to fight too much to make them do that. Um, but at the same time, especially with the way uh, the new rope simulations work so well, I would be inclined to just run a nice rope simulation, let them pop, make it, bake it down, and be like, okay, cool, that's the final state. Um, but being able to do it parametrically, not having to run a simulation, obviously there's a lot of utility in that as well. Um, what else do we got? Um, no, that one's not interesting. Um, this one's kind of interesting. Um, let's turn off a bunch of these. So what do I got here? Um, we haven't talked about Mesh to Spline at all. Uh, Mesh to Spline is a different plugin, another standalone plugin from Rocket Lasso, and it allows you to convert your splines into or I'm sorry, meshes into splines parametrically. So that's what we've got right here. In fact, why don't we do this? Yeah, why don't we do this from scratch, essentially? Um, and we don't need any of these deformers. So here's a nice font that's 8-bit operator. Um, and so it's super low poly, kind of kind of cool look. Now I want to convert this into, well, I've got a look in mind I want to do. So what I would like to do is convert these to splines, but not make it editable. So mesh to spline. I'll create that. If you feed it in as a parent, you see all of the edges have converted. The end gons are being rep you know, the end gons are exploded, but we can say, hey, erase out the end gons, and now we're left with just those nice clean outlines, which by itself that could be you know all we want. But we've also got additional settings where right now those are the edges. But I'm gonna say, actually, I'd like you to give me the polygon. So we're now outlining each polygon and erasing out the end gons. So then I could say offset and push these all away from the surface. You can see that's kind of cool. We can also go in, but yeah, push those away from the surface. Just the hair, just one. So now I'll take this spline, uh, which we you know we've com parametrically converted that text. Which you know, of course, we, well, I'll wait for that bit. No, I'll wait for a different idea. Take the mesh to the spline, feed that through a smooth. It's going to obliterate it because it's very low point count. But let's say that it's step based. So let's get rid of all smooth, double click, and you can see that I'm now subdividing that by whatever amount I want. And you go pretty small, I'm gonna say like two, so you can see there's a lot of subdivisions. Meaning, as I add on a little bit of smoothing, we can round out these corners. Now keep in mind, if you want really sharp fidelity on a corner, we'd have to heavily subdivide. So if I say a step of one, you see it's very subdivided, meaning I can just do one or two iterations and it's a very tiny, tight corner. Um, so that's kind of the shape I'm going for. But you could imagine you want to do it with a lower point count. But in any case, you can see that we get those nice rounded curves. But we're going to have a lot of redundant geometry here. Like, look at all these points that we had to create to round out those corners. So let's feed that. Not surprised. Actually, well, we haven't used cleanup too much. Let's make a cleanup spline. And the cleanup spline, I'll double click, is going to get rid of every single point that was doing nothing. Nothing whatsoever. There is no threshold for it. And you'll see that every single one of those points that was right there was a perfectly straight line. So it was contributing nothing, so just get rid of them. Now, personally, I would, I usually reach more for a uh, reduction and a deviation so a deviation of 0.1 so it's going to you know even better get rid of points in a, in a slightly smarter way so there will be fewer um, but that's working well for me if we go to advanced you can see that we had actually subdivided that all the way up to almost 20,000 points reduced it down to 5,000 points so yeah now we've got a parametric rounded out spline here which i could feed through a volume builder volume measure say that this is going to be sampled every one have a radius of one, a voxel size of 0.5. Uh, maybe I don't want to go too far. Let's say one. Oh, okay. It was uh, fine in this particular case. So you can see that we're blobbing these together. Uh, I'd like to round it more. So I'll grab the smoothing. I'll smooth it a few extra times. Yeah, there we go. Pull that corner away. There we go. That's working pretty well for me. And clean that up and take a look. It's like, okay, cool. I've now got, I've now got the what I had in my head, here's like the shape I wanted to design, and there it is all converted. The best part, obviously, when <laughs> any tool that we make is it is now parametric. So I can say A, B, C, D, E, and that's gonna filter all the way through the entire system, converting it to a spline, smoothing it out, removing points, making a volume builder, making a volume measure, and it's automatically updated all the way through the entire process. So super duper fun along those lines. And remember, we did the early demo, but being able to run a simulation on the splines. We can you know, put a simulation tag on any of uh, the spline modifiers and that will work. Um, let's see, does anybody have any more technical questions? Obviously, like when the season five of Rocket Lasso Live begins next week, 
I'll be able to answer additional questions and do no more demos. I'm sure that we'll be getting questions that I'll just naturally be using these. So, you know, you definitely count on that. Um, but yeah, are there any questions right now during this live stream? Because we're going to be wrapping up pretty quick. Slicer, we haven't talked about Slicer. Why don't we do a Slicer demo? It's going to be very similar to the one I did in the other video, but I just think it's a really fun demo to do. Um, so if anybody has any questions, is there a way to bake the tick marks into the spline and render them? Mm, no, nothing that we did. <clears throat> One second. I wonder if a cloner would place them in the exact same way we're placing. So I, I just want to see, let's exaggerate these to two. If I make a end side and you set the end side to two, it's actually an open single spline. I'll make a length of two or a radius of two, which probably means one. Feed that into a cloner. Tell the cloner to clone on to an object. And the object will be the reduction. I want to clone on to every vertex. Um, I guess it did want to be two. Um, looks like... Uh, no, that's matching shockingly well. Um, the angles are slightly different, probably because of where... Oh, wait. Uh, it might actually be similar if I do a... Oh, no. I thought there was a smooth distribution, but it doesn't seem to be. Well, anyway, you can see it's not exactly the same. If I click here, you see that they're slightly out of alignment. But, you know, just by cloning onto the vertexes, like, it, they seem, like, really, really similar. So, yeah, no setting to render them, but it's there. Um... So I wanted to do just one last demo, just to use Slicer, just because why not? I like I like our own plugins. Um, so here's the thought. Let's. I'd like to do different text, but I'm trying to think of what I'd want to type instead because it's you know I want it to be quick for a live stream. So I'll just do RKT. Why not? Uh, set it to the middle. We'll bring up lemon milk bold. And what I'd like to do is round all these out. So, you know, it's it, the, the utility spines are amazing for taking it like an existing font and modifying it into something slightly different. So in this case, I'll feed this into uh, a smooth. I shall heavily subdivide. Step mode, set that to two, and just round it as much as I want to. So there we go. Nice, soft, rounded edges. Then I would like to create a sphere. Yeah, we'll do spheres. It'll be a similar demo. I don't, I don't mind doing a similar demo. Um, especially because I don't know how many people actually watch the instructional videos. So, sphere, put into a cloner. Said cloner is going to clone onto an object. The object will be the smooth. Bunch of spheres. Okay, that's fine. I'm going to say, uh, don't worry about aligning them. And then, they'll all move around with a plane effector. No, I think we can do random a random effector and I would like to first of all affect their scale so I'll scale them uniformly but I do want them to go negative so not absolute scale so some will get bigger some will get smaller and I want overall them to be smaller and then I'll add another should I have them scale nah keep it simple I'll add another random and we'll call this one random position this one would be random dot Scale. Uh, yes, position not on Z, so zero Z. Let's route wander probably pretty far. 200. 200 might be too much. 155. And give those some speed. Indexed, noise based. Hit play. Slow them way down. 22. 11. That's fine for, our, for this demo. Uh, we can double our frames. Okay, now I need some geometry here. So let's extrude our sweep. Doesn't need to be too deep. I'll just say 10 will probably work. Okay, now I'll make a big old blob out of these. I love me some volume builder. So I'll drop in the cloner, which does work, and I'll throw in the extrude. And now those are all blobbed together. Turn these into a mesh. So that into a measure and 
change the resolution. So we'll set that to five. Yeah, there we see the geometry. We're gonna keep a very low poly for our doing this in a live stream. If I play, we're gonna get pretty reasonable playback here. I might wanna crank it up. Some of these might be a little twitchy in the end because of like the really low resolution I'm doing. But you can see that we've now got these lovely blobs traveling around, hitting the text, passing through. But I want a very, very two dimensional effect here. Like I want this to be perfectly flat. How would I do that? Well, it just so happens we have a plugin that can help with that. I have a completely different plugin. This is Slicer from Rocket Lasso, and it is going to create a series of cuts through an object. Now, in this particular, well, you know, if somebody's not familiar, the most basic version would be let's just make a. Actually, it's always fun with a landscape, so I'll make a landscape object, make it a little bit taller, and we'll feed the landscape. Actually, I'll remote link into it to landscape hide the landscape and now you see that i'm getting a series of cuts through it as a spline if you didn't know about it i can also say auto scale and it's going to snap to the exact scale of that make as many cuts as i want you can see what it's doing so you know that's the main point of the tool but there's a lot more settings there for like expanding them out and animating them and uh, changing the spread there's offset uh, we have a rate here, so you can actually animate them. I can have plate. You see they'll travel through it. Lots of cool settings on there. But anyway, let's do a brand new one again. Not on the landscape, but this time I would like a slicer. I'm going to tilt it sideways here. And I'd like it to make a single cut. Just one little cut. And because of the placement of the extrude, I'm just going to scoot it back ever so slightly. So what is that going to be cutting? Well, I can make it a child, but I'm going to remote link into the volume mesher and let's hide the original object. And now you can see I've got a spline, like a 2D cutout of everything. So if I play here, now we got a, a two dimensional flat version of it. Now this does have some settings built in, but let's just do the rest with the utility splines because that's what we're here to really talk about. I'll feed this through a smooth and let's do our standard subdivide once and add in just enough ticks that we don't see like the bumpiness anymore. I'm gonna get rid of this minimum length and let's add in some counter scale so it doesn't shrink too much. So I said it's gonna be a little poppy because we didn't make the resolution very high on the volume measure. But you can now see that I've got a two dimensional cut of these lovely blobs traveling through and we've got a final mesh here. If I wanted to, I could reduce, let me double click here. You can see we've got a nice even distribution of points along everything. Um, Actually, when I subdivided, I probably should have done a step. Um, yeah, that's already a little bit smoother. Uh, and we could shrink the step more if we want that to be sharper. So yeah, it's working pretty well. That smooth, if we want, we could feed through a reduction. And now the deviation will say of only like 0.1. And now if I double click here, you can see that's going to be removing a whole bunch of points here. You see how it's like running really well, where it's like all these points are being automatically removed. Uh, you can see the point count, which is going to be constantly changing, but we're moving about 40% of the points in general. So yeah, now we got a spline ready to rock. I can feed that through an extrude. Uh, I don't like auto mode, so I'll set that to Z. Um, oh, uh, we have it rotated, so I guess it would be on Y. Uh, yeah, extrude that just 20. And now we've got some lovely, uh, like a, a two-dimensional version of that blobbing around entirely. Again, like as I always build, entirely two-dimensional. We could uh, make twice as many blobs, have these all traveling around, squishing through each other, make a uh, slightly different material, just get it some color. Slap that onto our extrude and set that to be only on C1. So there, now we got the edge and the front being different colors. And yeah, a lovely, like a simple use of slicer to make something two dimensional and then make it look like a lovely blob like this. It's also, if, if somebody hasn't done it, layering up several slicers is a, cool, is a cool way of getting thickness on a line that would be completely impossible if not for it. Um, so let me show you, instead of extruding this line, here, this is a weird workflow, but uh, I'll feed this into another volume. So volume builder, volume mesher, uh, voxel of two, increase sample size, radius of two, um, radius of four. Yeah, so now you can see I've got a line. There's a thick line now traveling around the entire thing. Now it's not gonna be perfect because you get like these weird little blobby edges like that. We could, we could keep on cranking up resolution which would make it look better, but I'm just gonna ignore that for now, just keep it in mind. But now we've got a line with some thickness there. 
Um, and that line's kind of like absolute. So if I were to sneakily grab our slicer here, just make a duplicate. We already know it's in the right spot. I'm going to say, hey, don't look at this volume measure. We'll just say volume measure one. Instead, we've got volume measure two. So go ahead and look at volume measure two for us and hide it. And now I've cut the thickness of the second volume measure. And now we get this perfect double line traveling along there. Now, keep in mind, that wouldn't work for like a rail spline or anything. There's a completely different point count on them. But yeah, look at the, we've converted those. And now if we want to be silly, we could feed that back through another smooth. Um, you know, I probably want to do another step resample and then, you know, very light on this, but just to get rid of those like really, you know, the jagged edges. And also the, um, I don't know if it, it's true, but yeah, remember I was saying that we're gonna get like some weirdness because of our low poly stuff there, but smooth is automatically like, well, that was really tiny, so remove it. So that is gonna go a long way for making that stuff not pop. Now we might get a little bit more slow down now because we're doing multiple volumes and slicers and smoothing, but now look at like this more complex spline. Now that shape could be fed through an extrude with a little bit of thickness and for an entirely parametric layout. Like this is absolutely crazy. Look at that. Uh, and again, entirely parametric. So we can do a one, two, three. Filters all the way through the system. Oop, I added it to it and it's still running pretty quick, which is pretty good. One, two, three, updates the entire thing, ready to go. Look at this crazy rig, having everything be layered up. So absolutely love it, super cool. Um, I haven't, I'm not sure how trim works on a uh, close spline, but let's try grabbing that. Uh, this could go slower, but I'm gonna put a dash. Now we got a dashed line on top of that if we want it. And instead of a dashed line, let's grab, if for anybody who's missed it in the stream, Rocket Lasso has been making some capsules for Maxon. And if you have Maxon one subscription, then you already have these right now. These got released this month. There's a new dash spline and a trim spline. So if I drag the trim spline in there, uh, we should be able to erase it out. So we could even have that like keyframe in while like while those are being created. Well, that would be a bad idea because spines are being created and disappearing. But at any given point, we could see it. If they weren't animated, then it would be good to drag these in or out. But yeah, I guess right now, because we're changing segment counts and point counts, they're going to be popping a little bit. But yeah, you can and on the still have those animate in as well. So yeah, a lot of different ways of layering everything. So let's see if anybody has... Uh, yeah, Eric, those are brand new. Uh, I'm going to be making some videos about those very soon. Um, I was going to do it this week, but I, I had to get uh, utility splines out or we, never, we were never going to do it. Um, I want to do the raffle, but I also wanted to explain the tag to segments. Um, so we're going to risk it, everybody. Anyway, it's a little risky, but I'm going to try and do the demo about redshift and it's only risky because my video cards don't like redshift um i've used it on other machines and it works perfectly it just doesn't like this one but it shows off really really nicely and it's the one i used in the demo but i'm gonna use it again anyway so we got the we got this lovely car it's already smoothed out it's pretty much a demo we walked through and you can see that the smooth is already set up to smooth it out with subdivisions and iterations so we want this to render Actually, we don't have to, parts of these, I don't even have to render anything. I'm going to lock this uh, because I want to see the colors. If I click on the spline tab, we haven't even talked about the spline tab, and there's also some advanced settings in here. They, you know, they're, they're less artistic, but they do, do, they do certain things. But anyway, let's go to the spline tab because there's a lot of things you can change here. We already know that we're feeding in six different splines here, six different spline objects, and we're feeding in probably hundreds of different segments all into a smooth. Now, the spline tab allows you to do things like reverse the direction of the splines, which can, you know, certain circumstances, really important. So you can parametrically do it. We can tell it if the segments, right now, the segments are being output the way that they're coming in. So they're coming in as six objects, they'll be output as six objects. But we could technically say as a single object, and now all of them have been baked down. But of course, a single object can't return multiple colors, so it's only one. So as input is a good default. But more fun is colorize, which is currently as input. If something's red, it's going to be output as red. But we've got none, which would enable you to override it with like your basic color. But we've also got random, which is going to randomly assign any color of the rainbow onto 
every single individual spline. So I can click randomize and you can see each of these being a completely different color assigned. And, you know, finding a, finding a good one can be pretty cool there. So it's like, oh, it's like, oh, that's a cool color. And then you leave that because that's what you want to work with. In addition, though, that's uh, randomizing the color with a completely random color. But we can also do a grayscale color. And grayscale is important because in, you know, in a lot of the third party renderers, you can remap the colors onto like whatever rainbow you want to. So instead of us building in like gradients and all these custom controls, we just give it a grayscale. Now you can make whatever you want. In addition to all that, though, I go back to random color. We are outputting, you know, a single spline or each object as its own spline, but we can also say explode all. And explode all will take every individual segment of a spline and explode it out, which means here, now we get like crazy rainbow colors because even though this is only one spline, that one spline might have like 100 segments in it. So now it gets 100 different colors. So we can keep on clicking here, get lots of different colors. You could keyframe your seed and get like a, a rave car going if you wanted to. So another option there. Uh, in addition, well, let's turn off explode all. We'll go back to as input. Uh, something to note is, um, actually, no, I want to go to as input for the color and segments. I want to do explode all because if you if I say explode all, you'll see that everything is still the correct color. But if I make this editable, you'll see what's actually doing is every one of the interior spines. Like I said, there's probably a whole bunch of them. If I keep scrolling, oh man, there's a lot. Scroll, 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 scroll. Oop, okay, there we go. Um, there are, it's, there's so many that Cinema's not even telling me how many there are. You know, there's probably a couple hundred different splines there. But you can see that each one's been named appropriately. It's been given the correct color and they all exploded as a separate segment. So certain MoGraphy things might be able to see these as different objects now that Utility Splines is outputting it as all, all of these different objects. Um, Important to note that the spline tab is identical no matter which of the which of the five different utility plugins you're using. Um, but anyway, let's bring this back to single. No, not single. In, as input, colorize, random. So that's going to give us these random colors. Now, here's the dangerous part because my computer does not like Redshift while I'm streaming. Let's try making a Redshift material. So let's say we're switching to Redshift. And, oh, if I freeze and disappear, then official end of stream, I'm not going to come back again. And I apologize to everybody. Um, but that would be it. Um, oh, I guess Demi is asking, before closing, could you share if, you're, uh, if you are on any new plugin projects um, or capsules and when the new live season will start? Uh, all those things have been covered, but I like recapping, especially if we're about to freeze. So right before I potentially freeze the computer. Yes, we're working on new plugins. I'm going to be launching a brand new beta soon uh, with a tool I'm really excited about. Very different than anything we've worked on before. It's not spline based. Um, and we got a couple other little ones. We had, we, had, we had a different plan for the way we we're going to do Rocket Lasso tools originally. Originally, the idea was going to be a giant suite of all the spline tools, all as one giant launch. Um, but then each individual tool took too long. We, we would have never launched a, a plugin if, that, if we had done that. But essentially, we have some slightly smaller tool ideas that we already put a lot of work into. So we're going to start releasing those at a much lower price point. Um, and then we've got a couple of other little ideas. So those are going to be coming out. Also, we are working with Maxon for right now, uh, working on monthly capsules. And a bunch of them have already been put out there so actually i was only talking about the ones we just launched this month but there's several there's actually a bunch uh if i search for rocket lasso you should be able to see all of them so some of these came out uh like last year where we had the grid so here's a spline grid we have the fooey ring um and then recently we had this wave spline come out the wave spline is pretty cool it makes uh sine waves and sawtooth waves and square waves and custom random noise waves sounds pretty fun uh, and then we have the older uh, Fui graph, which is really powerful. And then the new ones are dash spline and trim spline. Um, but I already know what the next, well, first we've kind of already finished, all but finished two of them. So that will be the month, next month and the month after that. And we're in the middle of working on the one that comes after that. So we've got a bunch more down the pipeline that we're working on. So I'm excited for those. Um, the next three are actually like really exciting. Like almost every tool that we work on, I like more than the one before. Um, so I can't do any spoilers of what they are, but those are on the way. I'm super excited. Um, and yeah, we're, we're building these tools as if they're full on rocket lasso plugin type things are, they're, they're a little simpler than ours, but yeah, you just, if you have max on one, you've already got these. So definitely go check them out. There's also, if you search rocket lasso, you can see all these example files as well. 
Um, oh, why is it not showing up? There's a, another plugin that isn't showing up. Maybe I forgot to tag it Rocket Lasso, but we also made a stair generator, um, which is pretty cool. Let me just drag one in, because why not? Um, so yeah, we've got the stair, parametric stair generator. Nothing super fancy, but just some nice clean geometry. Unlock there. You see that uh, it's got a bunch of different settings here. We can make as many steps as we want to, and it's pivoting from the back spot and change the width and the height and the depth and uh, step, you know, a bunch of settings, step thickness and boards. We got uh, different types of stairs, like here's some boards on top. And then here's just floating boards. We can get rid of the step thickness. You just get solid ones. There's a whole example file with a whole bunch of different ones and they layer up really nicely. Different directions, different bevels for rounding things out. So yeah, pretty cool tool there, doing lots of things. So yeah, definitely check out, you know, search uh, Rocket Lasso in the uh, asset browser and see a bunch of tools that it's almost like free plugins from Rocket Lasso. Um, and uh, like I said, I'm gonna be recording videos about those <clears throat> very soon. Man, I'm out of uh, practice for these live streams. Usually I can talk for like two or three hours. Um, anyway, let's um, let's potentially crash my live stream. Like I said, if it, we disappear, it's gone, but let's try this out. Anyway, um, I set this to Redshift. Now let's make a simple Redshift material, Redshift material standard. Um, and let's see, go inside the material. I'm going to right click and search for user. So I want the color user data. Ooh, it's getting upset. Eh. And then for the actual material, I want no color. I want no reflection. I do want, where is it? Emission, I want an emission of one. And I want, if, if you didn't know this, this is really cool. Do you see how we got in this material node? We got all these different nodes. If you hold down, I think control, as I click on this second circle here, it'll automatically pop it out and populate it in the node. So super powerful. So now, I'm going to say I want to load in the preset of, oh, it's a video freezing up. Uh, okay, I'm going to stop it if people are saying it's not working. Oh, somebody's saying it's, people are saying it's getting dangerous. Um, should we fight through? Presets, mo or, uh, object, display color. I want the color of the object. It's a little laggy in my end, but it's not insane hopefully that filters through so now if we want that to render in redshift i have to say um where is it uh, render tags redshift object curve i want to see them as hair strands and yeah so that should render anyway this is not going to render properly because the redshift tag doesn't filter down the children automatically so inside of my tag i could say hey copy that to the children and now i will try doing one render and then we're escaping out of there so we got these custom colors uh render um what do i, I haven't rendered in a little bit i want the render to render view Stop that, turn that on, and let's see. There you go, boom, instantly renders without the tag being on there. Let me kill it. Okay, so hopefully that's not doing anything anymore. Without the tag being on there, that won't filter down. So you have to, whatever causes a thing to render in Octane or Arnold and Redshift, you gotta put that in and it will automatically filter the children, which I can demonstrate here. And let me turn off, Hopefully we didn't crash. I'm gonna turn off Redshift just in case. You can see if I make this editable and I go down, that you can see the tag is now filtered down to all the children. So that's the important part there. Okay, we made it through everybody. Um, yeah, uh, so is the, on Twitch, is the video back again? I'll spin around the car. Yeah, that's the danger of hitting Red, go on Redshift on my machine. It fights, uh, it fights with the, the CPU of my, uh, my streaming software or the GPU use of my streaming software. Um, the important, I mean, the last thing to do before we close it all out is going to just be 
Thank you, everybody, for supporting Racket Lasso. For those of you who have been supporting on Patreon, there are people who have been supporting on Patreon for getting on five years now, which is very much appreciated. And thank you especially for purchasing the plugins we make. We work really hard on these. We love seeing what people end up making with them. If you do make anything with them and you want to show it off, like send it my way. I love seeing those things. Um, but the best way to support us is to get a tool that will help make you more productive, help you get, you know, complete client work faster so you can do even more client work and get more money so hopefully it just helps everybody win across the board the discount code for today and tomorrow only is launch party you should see it in the links below check out the videos i've got a bunch of videos talking about every single setting in way more detail than we went here but this time we did tackle some very different projects than usual but thank you so much everybody for supporting us thank you so much for coming here today and hanging out and chatting, asking questions. It makes this a lot of fun to do. And I'm really looking forward to beginning the proper live streams next week. So it'll be at two o'clock central time, the same time I've been doing these for how many years now? <laughs> uh, but that'll do it. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. And I gotta find the right button here and I'll see you in a week. Bye-bye, everybody.